Join us as Pastor Art Dykstra walks through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. A couple of commercials before we start. Um, as you saw on the way in, the youth is going to rock the universe. Way to defray some of the costs. They're doing a service for us. So you can love Jesus and eat some baked goods, right, afterwards by donation. Help our youth group go to rock the universe. Um, a couple things. We really want to invest in men, in particular men um, we need investing in. And we want men to be discipled, to grow and have the skills set to uh, understand what it is to live this walk of faith. And so we have two new studies. The first one is Proven Men. It starts on September 10th, uh, Monday night. This, the reports coming back from the last two uh, times that we've done it have been literally life-altering for the people that have gone through it. It's a, a lot of work. There's homework involved, but it is transformative, um, not only from looking at life through the perspective of a sexual integrity, but just discipleship, finding out what this means to understand the wonderful cross and how that affects where the rubber meets the road here in this life. Doug has really invested himself. Doug Lardner, you can meet him in the Welcome Center after the service. You can sign up online. There is a book that you need to buy, and that's why we're letting you know. So it's a week and a half or basically on the 10th, so 10, whatever, I don't know what date it is, a week and a day from here, um, but you have time to get that book. Secondly, we have a book study on Disciples Are Made, Not Born. Doug Allen, who taught last week, is starting a 13-week study on Tuesday night for men who don't have the time or can't work on a Monday. This is a great way, men, for us to go a little deeper. 13 weeks. You could talk to Doug. He'll be up here praying afterwards, or you could sign up online. But you also need to get a book. It's 10 bucks for that. Now, one of my favorite nights of the month is called First Friday. We're having a First Friday again this First Friday, this week, this Friday. Last one, if you were there, it was kind of nice. We try to keep it the same length as a regular service. We invite people. We have child care. But we invite people to grab their kids, come back in, and we'll continue worshiping if that's the way the Lord leads. And um, it, that's the way he led last time. And it was, we finally had to kick people out of here. It's getting late. Go home. Don't you have places to go? But no one wanted to leave. The spirit of God was so present. There's no, it's not a time of teaching. It's a time of going into deeper worship, uh, getting into a deeper relationship with the Lord through worship and prayer. It's not boring. It's not just sitting, hearing one person pray. It's interactive. And everyone says the time goes by. It's, if you've never been, it's really a remarkable evening. We are also wanting to love our neighborhoods. And so we have a, uh, we're joining a group called Back to Church Sunday. This is a national event. It doesn't just happen here. But what they've done is they've encouraged people as a way to encourage our One membership of the and, and the church to invite your friends and neighbors. So we're giving every one of these a card. You can see the usher. People to take three to five of these cards and Give them to their coworkers or neighbors. Invite them to our place of fellowship called Feather Sound. Um, and also specifically, here's the ask. If you would be praying that God would put on your heart to give you one, give you one person that maybe God would help allow you to share and have a gospel conversation with one person over the next two weeks. Now, September 16th is when it is Back to Church Sunday for this global event. And so we're doing a few special things. We have a bounce house for kids between service and after service. We have snow cone machine, balloon artists, some photographers. To make it fun, we have uh, our very own chef going to cook us some pulled pork. Nothing says Jesus like pulled pork, right? No, I don't know if that's true, but um, it doesn't hurt because we're under the new covenant. Um, I digress. Get these. And invite somebody. It'll be a great night. Oh, the 15th, the week before at 9 a.m., we're going to meet here because we're going to blanket Feather Sound. And we're going to go hand out the remnants of these things to invite our neighbors and tell them that we love them. It's not awkward. We're just going to hand these out, leave them at their front door, things like that. Um, so please join us. Second to last, we have beach baptisms coming up. September 16th, Indian Rocks Beach. People can show up in advance, you know, have a potluck or whatever, some picnic on the beach. But... Have a beach baptism on the beach. You can look online under feathersoundchurch.com baptisms to sign up or to find out where we're parking. Last September when we did it, it was such a glorious night. 
Uh, if you've never been baptized, I encourage you. This is a step of faith and obedience that we do. We don't get baptized to get saved. We do it because Jesus says, hey, this is what you're to do, a public declaration. Um, so please join us for that. You could sign up online for getting baptized because we'd love to discuss with you what that means. Lastly, if you're new here, there's a connect card in the front. We'd love you if, you, if you've been here for the first time or second time, we have a free gift for you in the Welcome Center. We'd love to connect with you just to touch base. So we are moving in to Romans chapter one. It took us two weeks just to get out of the first verse. I promise it won't be like that every single week. We're covering three verses today. Um, it, was anyone here last Sunday, second service? Don't be shy, a bunch of people. I just want to point out, unlike Brother Doug, who gave this excellent message, I actually come to church with pants on. Inside joke, I guess, if you had listened to the message. If you're not, you're just thinking I'm weird. Um, it's Doug. You have to listen to the message online. But what B Doug basically said in Romans chapter 1, it's, it's all about Paul. He's this great apostle, he says. Apostle just means sent one. And Paul was public enemy number one. We painted the picture before. He's on his road to Damascus, public enemy number one against Christianity. I'm going to go and take all these Christians, put them in jail. A great persecution arose because of him. on the way there, there's something significant that happened. He had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus in power, so much so that the blinding light caused him to go blind. And then he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And because of that, because of this encounter, his life goes from being public enemy number one to Christianity to the number one supporter, the number one sold out person. And that only happens if you have a real encounter with a living God. And as a result, he goes on to say, Paul, an apostle, set apart. The word is consecrated. It is something that a Hebrew would know, and they would know very clearly because the word consecrated means to be set apart for singular purpose. And so, for example, this microphone right here that I'm using, this microphone is set apart for amplification here on Sunday morning. I'm not using it to play baseball. I'm not using it as a hockey puck. It is consecrated for one purpose, to amplify the voice so that we could hear this morning. All right? And Paul says, because of the cross of Christ, because of the reality that there is a resurrected Jesus who so changed my life, I am now single-minded, singular focused in the one thing that I'm dedicating my life to. It has impacted me so great. I'm consecrated and set apart for one thing. And it says what that one thing is. And it says it's the gospel of God. The gospel. It comes from the Greek word angelion. We translate it as the gospel and Contemporary translations say it's the good news. I, I think we do ourselves a bit of a disservice when we say good news. Because it's not just good news. Has anyone been to the Grand Canyon? A couple of people. I mean, I, I hiked the Angel Bright Trail. You don't stand there and go, if I were to name this big gash in the, in the earth here, you know, living in Florida, you go to this. I wouldn't call it the pretty good canyon. Right? In fact, I think the Grand Canyon does this. It's the stupendous canyon. It is the mind-blowing canyon. It is amazing. The canyon of all canyons. Uh, the mother of all canyons is what you call This is it. This is not the good news. This is the stupendous news. And Paul is saying, I've been set apart because I have the good news of all good news. And I want my life to count to celebrate it. And so where we're going in Romans 1, verse 2 through 4, is a true Bible study. So read with me, if you could, verse 2. The gospel he promised beforehand through his promise, prophets, in the Holy Scriptures, regarding his son, who as to his human nature was the descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's a lot of stuff packed in here. So we're going to go deep. Again, it's less of a message and more like a true Bible study. But the first thing he says is that this is good news, the gospel that was promised beforehand. My first way my brain works is I think about why in the world do we even need good news? Why do we need stupendous news? Because it doesn't take a rocket science to look around and say this is a broken world. I just finished reading a book last night, late. It was the story, the biography of Gracia Burnham. If anyone you remember, her and her husband Martin were missionaries in the Philippines in 2001. They were kidnapped by Abu Sayyaf, one of the bin Laden offshoots. 
And they were in imprisonment for over a year by these Muslim uh, extremists. People were beheaded throughout the path. People were killed. They were treated poorly. And in the middle of all this, you just see the brokenness of this world. You look and you go and you see the poverty and the insane things that happen. When we went through the book of Philippians, what struck me is that these, as we get to Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, I talked about how the, it's so crazy, the brokenness in the mind and that we spend more money on stress and anxiety disorders than we do on fixing things like cancer. And the mind is broken. The bodies are broken. Cancer is rife. And you look around and you see the fallen nature. Just looking at the news recently, I have a, a slide that I had taken from my phone from Fox News. And there was during the last Super Bowl, uh, uh, and in August, he was convicted finally. But he and his son are watching the Super Bowl, arguing over a bowl of wings. Hey, these are good wings. No, they're not that great. No, they're really good wings. Pulls out his gun, shoots his son in the chest. Over a bowl of wings. By the way, if you have small kids here today, I, there's a few PG-13 things that I'm going to be talking about. I don't mean to be graphic, but this may not be the appropriate message. Um, we do have child care. But he, 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 here's the deal. You go to the Jacksonville just two weeks ago, a video game competition. The guy loses, and so what's the logical response? I'm going to take out my gun and start shooting, the, shooting people. A guy in Clearwater made the national news just a couple weeks ago. Why? Someone parked in a handicapped spot that shouldn't have been parking there. It's wrong. You don't just shoot somebody over parking in a handicapped parking spot. This world is broken. And I'm telling you, these are just snippets. There are terrible things that happen in human trafficking here and over abroad. And you think about some of these things that happen. And there is a world that is broken and in desperate need of a cure. And it's called the gospel. The stupendous news that we all need. And it says that he gave us this through his holy prophets, this good news promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures. All kinds of books out there that call themselves scriptures. I was thinking about our faith. I was thinking about other religions. And my mind wandered to Muhammad in 610 AD. The angel, supposedly Gabriel, shows up and gives him a series of revelation at birth Islam. 1820s. A guy named Joseph Smith has an encounter with an angel who shows him these golden plates. And out of that, he's revealed this supposed ancient history of an ancient people. And he starts a new religion based on this unverifiable set of golden plates that were returned to the angel Moroni and con conveniently don't exist today. Jehovah Witnesses believe that Michael the archangel is Jesus. Came and showed up and affirmed to the leadership several times in the late 1800s, early 1900s that they are on the right path. Mayor Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, was a medium. She spent much of her life connected with the dead for much of her teachings, consulting the spirits. I looked on Wikipedia, and there is actually an entry that says there is, and it, the entry was amazing. In the last hundred years, all these new religions that have popped up, inventions of man, things revealed by angels, Things revealed by spirits, whatever. And I started thinking about the gospel of Jesus Christ revealed to the prophets through his holy scriptures. And the big difference between all these hundreds of things that have popped up, even in the last hundred years, and the gospel of which Paul speaks of, is that it's not new. It's, it's not something that just popped up or revealed by supposed angels. It didn't just show up because some guy in his mom's basement has an internet connection and a blog site. And he decides this is going to be something. This is not something new. It says clearly that it was a foretold heritage. In Galatians 1.8, Paul addresses the church in Galatia who started off in the spirit. And because of their religious background and bringing up, he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Why do you start in the spirit and try to perfect in the, with works? They basically were saying, hey, I'm saved by grace, but I'm maintained by works. And he says, look, it's a, a distortion. 
And it's no gospel at all. He says, even if an angel comes to you or even myself and gives you a different gospel, reject him. Let him be accursed because it is no gospel whatsoever. You go through Wikipedia and it actually says that uh, Christian science, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, all of them are just branches or sects of Christianity. False. It is a different gospel. It is no good news if it deviates from what Paul says. In a verse 2, he says, it was promised before through his prophets. We're going to speak a lot on the uniqueness of this good news that we celebrate here today. Do you know that there are 300 prophecies of Jesus throughout the Bible, some hundreds of years before Jesus, some literally thousands of years before. Some you need to be a scholar to understand, and some maybe Jesus could have planned out. We'll just count some of those. Jesus was reading the scriptures maybe, and he sees, oh, the Messiah is going to ride into town on a, a colt of a donkey, just like the, the king was going to come in. The, the, he's like, I'm going to do that. I'll be the fulfillment of that. Well, I, I don't think Jesus did that, but you could make the argument that he did, but there are some that you just look at and you go, there is no way that he could have predicted this. That he, there's no way, humanly speaking, that he could have made this happen. And it's one of those things that literally as I explored it, my mind just went, and how amazing and how trustworthy the statement is that it was foretold through his, holy pro his prophets, through the Holy Scriptures. I just took on this next slide a few snippets of the 300 from Genesis. Now, again, these are snippets. And it talks a lot about his genealogy, what he would do. He would successfully defeat Satan in Genesis chapter 3. The Messiah would suffer while redeeming man to God. He would come from the lineage of Seth, of Shem, of Abraham, of Isaac. Of, he goes and he's very specific. You move on to the next group in, in Psalms. And it's equally incredible. The things that he would do. I don't have time to go through because I had literally pages and pages of prophecies foretelling the coming Messiah and what he would do. There's a couple of really amazing ones in the book of Psalms. In Psalms, it talks about his lineage, very clear on his lineage, where he comes from. It talks about crucifixion in Psalms 22. Years, hundreds and hundreds of years before it was even invented, it spells out what it would look like. And that's how the Messiah would die. I mean, they, you can't make this stuff up. It says that no bones would be broken, which is odd if you know anything about crucifixion. The two thieves that were on the side of Jesus, they smashed his, their legs so they couldn't pull themselves up. It was very common to break the bones so they wouldn't be able to get up and breathe, but it didn't happen to Jesus. What a crazy, interesting fulfillment. Just the book of Isaiah alone is remarkable. Chapter 7 says he'd be born of a virgin. I mean, how do you pull that one off? From the line of David. No one chooses from what line they're born from. Chapter 9, he'd have a Galilean ministry. 11, God's spirit would be on him. Gentiles would seek him, which again would be odd because Jews didn't have anything to do with Gentiles. 40 tells us that his way would be prepared by someone like Elijah. That was John the Baptist. 50 says he was, he'd be spat on and struck. 52, disfigured, but then exalted. 53, rejected, would bear our sins. Again, amazing since almost universally the Jews believed he, the Messiah would come back as a political conquering hero, not a suffering servant. In that same chapter, he's compared to a lamb led to slaughter. You know, Jesus was killed, crucified at the same time the Passover lambs for Passover were being slaughtered, thereby fulfilling this feast that points clearly to Jesus, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. It says that he would die with transgressors in 53, but laid in a rich man's tomb. Jesus was poor. He was crucified between two thieves. He would take a poor man and he would toss him on a rubbish heap. Instead, Joseph of Arimathea grabbed the body, wrapped him up, prepared him, and put him in his own tomb. How do you plan that? Daniel 9, if we could go into Daniel 9's prophecy, it basically says that there would be 490 years from that point before the Messiah would atone for sin before the destruction of the temple. The temple was destroyed in AD 70. All the temple records 
It was very important for a Jew to prove his genealogy, his background. I'm from this line. I'm from that line. A number of reasons why it was important. But one of the reasons it was important is you had to be able to tell what line the Messiah came from. Clearly, Scripture foretold the Messiah would come through the line of David, the house of Judah. He had to come before 70. And Jesus is the only one who can fulfill it. Here's another one that just blows your brain. He'd be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. And here's the incredible part. That 30 pieces of silver would be used to buy the potter's field. <laughs> How do you plan that? Incredible. Here's another one. He would be born in Bethlehem but called out of Egypt and called a Nazarene. In a day and age where people just didn't have the mobility that we did, you were born in a location, you stayed in that location, you died in that location. You never traveled around. Jesus, because of a census, born in Bethlehem, fled because of Herod with his family to Egypt, was raised as a carpenter in Nazareth, completely fulfilling all three of those prophecies. A very famous mathematician named Peter Stoner was wrote a book, and he said the chances of eight of these fulfilled in one person, never mind all 300 of them, is one to the power of, one to the 10 to the power of 17, this astronomically huge number. 16 of them exceeds what he called, what is called Borel's law in mathematics, the law that says it's deemed impossible to happen. 300 of them, incredible, fulfilled in one person. Yeah, impossible, supernatural. The New Testament was written and distributed while eyewitnesses were still around. Why is that important? One, they could have refuted anything that we wrote here. No, that's not true. I'm going to, no, Jesus, no, that didn't happen. I was there. The body's still in the tomb, but they didn't. Now, you have a couple other things. You have 11 apostles who go to the grave, terrible deaths, crucified upside down. I'm telling you, if you're preparing my cross and it's upside down and I know that Jesus really didn't rise from the dead, at that point I'd say, all right guys, clever ruse, just let me go. I, I'll admit it, it didn't happen. Peter gladly went to the cross. I don't deserve to be crucified like my master upside down is how I'm going to do it. He gladly went. The brother of Jesus, whole life, he's no one special. He's my big brother. He goes to the cross Nothing special. He's my big brother. I'm sad about that type of thing. Not even a believer, John tells us. What changed? The same thing that happened with Paul. He had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Not over a lie, but because there's something here. That Jesus is no longer on the cross. Josh McDowell. He was in college an intellectual agnostic. And he was challenged to disprove the Bible. And this is what he said. The one thing that convinced me was prophecy. Prophecy changed. He says, I looked at it and I could, everything pointed to the accuracy of everything fulfilled here in the Bible. And we're not even talking about raised from the dead. How do you pull that one off? And verse three and four, it goes on to say, regarding his son, this gospel is predicted through the prophets, concerning one person, it's Jesus, the Messiah, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This gospel is about a son, God's son. This stupendous news is not a system or a moral law that you follow in this book that I've been reading, the, the story of Gracia Burnham and their abduction by Abu Sayyaf. The, it was very clear that you had all these different things that these Muslim extremists had to do and follow to be acceptable. And one of the reasons they all wanted to do jihad is it increased their chances of their good outweighing their bad. You know, they mentioned that a woman, if she had a hair that would come out of her head covering, she'd have to do a certain amount of years in hell to pay for her hair protruding from her head covering. And you look at that and go, I'm so glad it is not a system that I have to follow or rules that I have to follow, but it's a person. And there's two things that this scripture reveals to us this morning about that person. One, that he was 100% human and 100% God. 
There are 17 verses that describe Jesus the Messiah as the son of David. And there's two things we learn of that. Is one, he had a human lineage, but also that he had this title, son of David, was more than a lineage. To the Hebrews, it was a clear reference. When these people were called in, when these, when these people would show up to Jesus, they would say to him, they would say very specifically, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. And what they were referring to was this idea that he was the expected Messiah. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, I am the root and the offspring of David. How can you be the root, the source, and the descendant? Only the Son of God made flesh could say that. Now, this next slide. Um, I have some unique health issues. Um, and so I did 23andMe because I wanted to know a little bit about my ancestry, but also some, maybe there's some, shed some light. Um, I have a genetic variation called methyl tetrahydrate folate reductase. Say that a few times. And uh, 23andMe revealed that. I can get into it sometime, but it's not that exciting. But also, my mom was, my mom was adopted uh, into a Dutch household. All my grandparents were born in Holland, immigrated after the war. My mom doesn't know her background because she was adopted. My dad, told, he was born in Holland, total Northern European. His name was Arend Dijkstra. And they all moved when he was four. And so I was interested in knowing, hey, what, what are my roots? Well, this tells me, you can go back one. I'm Northern European, over 80%, 10% French, a smattering of a whole bunch of other conglomerations of things, but largely, completely Northern European. This is my genealogy. My dad's side, he can track his family and their names and kids and offspring back to the early 1600s. I have a spoon in our house that's been passed to the eldest Dijkstra for the last 230 years. It's kind of cool. And so I have this genealogy on my father's side. On my mother's side, it's a little bit uh, unclear. Um, but this revealed a lot. But here's the interesting thing. The next slide. It, 23andMe says I have 310 Neanderthal variants. 92% more than typical customers. I just say that probably if you're wondering about why I do certain things, that explains a lot, right? <laughs> I don't know the validity of the ancestors being Neanderthals, but I thought that was interesting. Anyway, moving on, right? Matthew and Luke, they trace Jesus' genealogy through Mary and Joseph. Matthew gives the genealogical proof that Jesus in his humanity was a direct descendant of Abraham and David through his son Solomon and subsequently Joseph, Jesus' legal father. Not blood, not 23 and meat following your, dean, your, your, your genes, but through his legal father. That would be important to his audience of Matthew, the Jews, because you would want to prove that you had a legal right to the throne as the king. Now, Matthew, Luke takes a little bit different, and it traces Jesus' blood lineage through his mother, starting through her father-in-law, going to Adam through David's son, Nathan. Jesus is a descendant of David by adoption through Joseph and by blood through Mary. Why do I bring all that up? I bring that up specifically is because these genealogies speak of Jesus' humanity and his divinity. In Colossians 2 verse 9, Jesus, it said of Jesus, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And because of that, while he was tempted, he did not sin. I'm painting a picture for us this morning of the resurrection of Jesus and what that means to us. Verse 3 talks about the humanity of Jesus. Verse 4 says, And through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God. How was he declared by power to be the Son of God? By his resurrection from the dead. And as a result of that, he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let me break that down to you. When it says the Son of God in power, it was evidenced by him defeating death. Why was he both man and God? Sin entered the world through our ancestors, Adam and Eve. Death entered the world through Adam and Eve because of the sin of man. Leviticus 9 says that the only way to be made right with God has been the blood of an innocent sacrifice. In the past, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant... It was through the death of an innocent animal as a temporary covering. 
to wait for the appropriate time of the coming and promised Messiah, promised in Genesis chapter 3, promised in Genesis chapter 12, and continued to be prophesied thousands of years, hundreds of years before through his holy prophets in the scriptures, that this is going to happen. The Messiah had to be all God, meaning not tainted by original sin, and thus able to defeat death by meeting God's 100% righteous requirement or standard. No sin in his life. And the only way to defeat death, death could not hold someone. The curse was not applicable to Jesus because he did not sin, but also 100% man so that he could identify with us and we with him in every way. Hebrews, 10, Hebrews tells us that we have a high priest who can relate to us in every way. You imagine Jesus' life. You can't, I mean, people would just sit there and say, well, you're just Jesus, man. How do I expect to live up to that? Yet he was born a man. He lived and experienced poverty, hardship, what it is to work with your hands. I have a blister right here because all day yesterday I was hacking, all afternoon I was hacking through putting in an irrigation pipe with an ax and getting through all these things. I'm experiencing the hardness of the toil of our labor. Jesus understood death. He understood sacrifice. And that he could relate to us in every way. Hebrews 10 says Jesus was the final perfect sacrifice that satisfied forever God's wrath against sin. He is the great sacrifice that absorbed the wrath of God because of our sin. If you give it to him. Jesus was not simply a good teacher as Gandhi would say. If he was, if he were, he'd just have a sin nature. He'd not be perfect and could not conquer death nor sin, nor save anyone. But since he was sinless, death could not hold him. And his victory was won for not only himself, but for us. If we give our lives to him. I just say all these things because the resurrection is super, super important for us. I felt impressed that we need to camp out here for a few minutes because if the resurrection were, did not happen, if you could disprove it, Christianity completely crumbles. Paul actually even says, man, we are meant most to be pitied if the resurrection is false because everything hangs on the fact that Jesus conquered death. And so people over and over and over through history have tried to disprove it. And over and over and over, those that really go with an intellectual heart to try to analyze it with an open heart end up becoming believers because there is such rock solid proof. The Muslims come in and say it's a coma. Jesus was in a coma. No, John actually points out that when they spear Jesus' side, water and blood come out. Actually, modern day doctors said there's indication of one thing, death, dead, dead. Not some whatever, coma or anything like that. It's called pericardial infusion. It's not a princess bride. He's almost dead. You know, it's all dead. And this is an indicator. Pericardial infusion. He's dead. He spent three days in a tomb. He didn't just get beaten to a pulp and then show up. Hey, I'm back, guys. Everything's good. No. He died. But did he rise again? I started to research this idea because I was beginning to be fascinated. Do other religions have accounts in their histories, in their sacred scriptures, does this even happen that dead people are raised from the dead by their own power or anything like that? I was actually initially disappointed because I found out that there's a, a, a ton of religious resurrections of deities. At first I was discouraged. I was like, okay. So I read every single one of them and started to do all kinds of research on them. I came across this article that was mocking Christians. There's like, Christians aren't even original. They can't even come up with their own resurrection story. They just copied it from all these other mythologies. And as I read every single one of them, I realized, and I had great hope because they're not even in the same category. First point, when you read all these other ones, they're clearly mythologies. The Greek, the Finnish, the Hindu accounts, I don't have time to go into all of them. I'll give, you a, I'll give you one example, the lowdown, and why this is a little bit PG. This is not me making it up, but this is something that they did. Is, and I'll clean it up as best I can. But you've got, you know, everyone knows the Greek god Zeus, right? The god of all gods, the Greek god, the mighty Zeus. Well, he's married to a lady named Hera, and he starts to fancy this girl named Persephone. So he has an inappropriate, inappropriate relationship with her. She gets pregnant. Hera, of course, is not very happy about this. So she does what every scorned wife would do. She calls on the Titans, this 
powerful group of demigods and says, I want you to go take care of Dionysus, the baby that was born from Persephone. So they go and do the logical thing. They eat baby Dionysus, but they save the heart. And they take the heart back and someone gets a hold of it and sews it into the thigh of Zeus where it gestates for nine months and whoop, pops out baby Dionysus again. Okay. I spent a lot of time in Central America. Quetzalcoatl is the, the, the Zeus there. In that story, Zeus, uh, Quetzalcoatl, the creator of those things, he has a situation where he drinks too much. Again, has inappropriate relationships with his sister. He's so ashamed that he builds a coffin, floats himself down a river, lights himself on fire, and the ashes turn into birds. I could explain some of these other stories as I walk through all these mythologies. They are clearly myths. Quite different than the story of the stupendous gospel that we're talking about this morning. The second thing that became very clear to me as I read this, that historians that actually do their homework... They say there's only one account of a deity that was resurrected, the story that predates Jesus. The deity, Zeus, might predate Jesus, but the story was crafted after the death of Jesus. You hear what I'm saying? It was almost like the enemy's like, wow, that one threw me for a loop. Um, I'm going to have a bunch of people write up some stories to say that Dionysus was resurrected and all these other so people down the line. It's kind of a clever strategy, I think, probably, but... You could see, as historians discuss these, the stories, there's no evidence that any of these stories predate Jesus, except for one, that of the Egyptian Osiris. Again, odd. She does something wrong, and so she's cut up into 14 pieces, scattered around Egypt, but doesn't actually come back to life. Isis has, has pity on her and makes her the demon in charge of the underworld. And that's as close as we get. As you can tell, there is not a single resurrection story that comes into the same category as what we're discussing. Here's where we're going to finish off this morning because the resurrection is absolutely critical. And here's the story of Paul set apart, called for one purpose. So deeply has this penetrated my heart. Gospel, the good news that I have one desire in life is that others would know it because it's stupendous news. And here's the uniqueness of the resurrection of Jesus. Let's put the silly mythology aside. Let's give, say we give them credence that, okay, maybe really Dionysus did pop out of Zeus's thigh. Here's some major differences. The first one is none of the other res others that were resurrected knew they were going to die. Um, the previous one. Oh, the, yeah, the first one. None of the others resurrected knew they were going to die. Ganesh in India. Osiris, Quetzalcoatl, Dionysus. The difference is Jesus predicted it himself. He knew it was by crucifixion because of the Old Testament prophecies, which is, again, strange because it hadn't even been invented when it was prophecy. But Jesus knew it was going to happen. He told his disciples over and over and over, I'm not going to be with you all. There's a time coming soon. Even the night before, he predicted that the Son of Man will be lifted up. None of them knew they did, were going to be resurrected except for one person, Jesus, our Messiah. Second, none went willingly. In John chapter 18, Jesus is on trial. He's before the Roman governor, Pilate. And they're having this discussion. They're saying, look, this guy says he's the king of the Jews. Of course, Pilate's going, look, there's only one king and that's Caesar. This is treason. He says, so you are a king. And he goes, yes, I am a king, but my king is not of this kingdom, is not of this, of this world. And yes, I'm a king. And for this purpose, I was born to be a king and to be lifted up on a cross. He went willingly. He tells Pilate, I alone have the right to stop it. You don't send me here. I send myself. And I can stop it. Unlike every other account Jesus went willingly. The third point for us to discuss in the uniqueness of this thing that we call the cross of Calvary and why it makes stupendous news for us this morning is that none were resurrected by their own power. Others did it for them. Jesus defeated death by his own power. John 2.19, he says 
to the leaders. He says, this is, he said, here, give us a sign. He says, this is what I'll do. I will destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up again. I will raise it up again. The other ones, they cheated death where Jesus defeated death. Fourth, in all the other accounts, none are predicted by prophecy. Do you know that there are 26 books that are considered divinely inspired? Like the Hindu Vedas, the Quran, the Book of Mormon. Other than the Bible, there's 26 other ones. And not one of them has, single, has specific fulfilled prophecies. There are some that they say there's prophecies, but they haven't been fulfilled yet. There's only one. And that's the Bible. Do you know that 27% of this holy scripture right here is scripture, is prophecy. Much of which has been fulfilled already. The fact of the matter is, is that it predicted thousands of years earlier that God would take this group of people for the last 2,500 years that were dispersed because of persecution, because of other kingdoms coming. No one knows where the Hittites live today, but we know where the Jews live. They live in a place called Israel because God took these people back and brought them into a homeland and it was prophesied in scripture that that would happen. At no other time in history has something that extraordinary ever happened. And a lot of it's been fulfilled already. The rest will be fulfilled with Jesus' second coming. None are predicted by prophecy except for one. Fifth, none have corroborating evidence. What do I mean by that? Journalist Lee Strobel, his wife becomes a believer. In that, he goes and says, well, I'm a skeptic. I'm an agnostic. I don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So I'm going to disprove it using my journalistic techniques. And I'm going to show my wife that this is nonsense. Subsequently, there's a movie and a book called Case for Christ showing his conversion. And these are his words, not mine. He says, as a skeptic, I was shocked to find that the historical evidence for the resurrection is so solid. I was thoroughly stunned by the quantity and quality of the evidence for Christ. So I followed this rabbit trail. Do you know that in secular world, the scientific world, there are three tests. If you find, hey, I'm an archaeologist, I come across this ancient writing, and there's three tests to figure out if there's truth in this ancient writing, or if it's just a poem or an epic or something that was written. And the three tests are this, the bibliographical test. In this test, what they, they, these guys do is they look at the statements that are made, and I got a copy right here and a copy right here. How well do these two match? So if I have a body of 20 of them or 30 of them or whatever, how many copies I have, how well do they match? The veracity will be in direct proportion to how close they match. If there's a lots of diverse, uh, diversity, there's a lot of different errors, they're going to say, look, this just, we can't trust this at all. The Bible doesn't do that. The Bible has incredible, it's actually kind of amazing. There are 20,000 approximately copies of ancient texts of the Bible in 15 different languages, totally in a different category than anyone else. And there's only minor spelling variations, very minor differences. You got a Syriac word instead of a Babylonian word or something like that. It's spelled different or something like that. There are no major differences in any of the copies that we have. In comparison, you've got Plato, Aristotle, Caesar, Tacitus, all these great people from the past. There's one to 20 copies of them. The second test within, uh, the second thing within the bibliographic test is how long from the original writing to the copy. So it was written this time, how many years after? And you have writings from Caesar that were like four or 500 years after him. How can I really trust that that's actually what Caesar wrote? Where ours, we have literally decades after John was alive that we have copies and fragments. We have tons of stuff within a generation. It just shows the accuracy bibliographically. Now, that just shows how well it was really copied. The internal test is what historians use. They want to know how accurate the statements are, and so they give a lot of weight to eyewitness accounts. You know, our Bible was written largely by people, especially the New Testament, eyewitness accounts. In a court of law, that's, they're going to put a lot of weight on determining the truth of something by an eyewitness. Does archaeology confirm, affirm, or contradict? The Bible far passes 
any writing of antiquity regarding the internal test. The third test that is so amazing is the external test. Does other literature corroborate? You have Roman historians who have no skin in the game. They don't want to prove Christianity. But you've got Josephus, Tacitus, Seotonius, Pliny. Plus you've got secular authors like Syrian and Greek authors that all show the veracity of this. I say all this simply because we celebrate here today the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ. And it can be shown with accuracy that what we are holding here today is truth that can be trusted. I'm going to invite Drew. He's going to come up and we're going to finish with communion. The ushers are going to come up and they're going to distribute the communion. Verse 4. It says that he was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus, our Lord. He was declared to be Jesus the Messiah. And the only thing to do, if that's actually true, if this cross is empty and there's no Jesus bones in a tomb, is to make Jesus our master and our Lord. Compared to the other resurrection stories, here's the other thing, the last thing I'll say about the uniqueness of Jesus, is that Jesus alone was able to save others. Because he alone defeated death. Communion is all about the resurrection. And here's a couple of asks before we close. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, look, when you take communion, he says the first thing to do is to examine your heart. And so the first thing that we must do as we sing this last song is, would you ask God to search your heart and try you? See if there's any sinful way and confess those sins to the Lord and ask him for forgiveness through your repentance. Because he is gracious to forgive. The second thing is don't take communion if there's a relationship division in your life. Paul says, get it right first. Just pass. It's no big deal. The third thing, don't take communion if Jesus isn't your Lord. It's, again, it's okay to pass. But on the heels of that, I would say, why not make Jesus Lord today? Our faith is built on a firm foundation. He doesn't ask us to blindly go into this relationship. Yes, there's an element of faith, but it's not blind. In Romans 1.20, well, we're getting a couple weeks. It says that God's invisible attributes are clearly made known so that man is without excuse. Meaning that when I go outside and I look at how this earth works, the, geo, the gravitational constants, and I go into all the physics and the laws, and I understand how a butterfly flies, and I see the beauty of creation. There is only one logical thing that man is without excuse, that he can never go and say, I, I had no idea that there was a God. And Jesus is the only logical and reasonable answer to our reality. And he alone is the source of this stupendous news, this greatest story on earth. And so I would ask that if you've never given your life to Jesus, that you would consider that 2,000 years ago, God from the beginning of eternity said, man is going to mess up. This world is going to get broken, but I'm going to send a solution. And I am the only religious system out there that actually brings in the solution that God identifies and comes down and deals with it himself and stands in the gap on our behalf. And he goes to the cross and that cross is now empty. We don't have a Jesus on that cross, as I mentioned earlier, because Jesus is risen. Because he alone could conquer the power of sin and death in your life. That it says that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, you will be saved. Not might be saved. Not a possibility. It says you will. If you believe with your whole heart, soul, and mind and you put your trust. Not as magic words that if you confess. Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are. That you did what you said you could do. That Jesus, you have the power to absorb the wrath of God poured out on sin in my life. That you have the ability to carry this burden that I'm wearing. Because of my sin debt. And I give it to you, Jesus. Take it from me. And live in my life. Guide me by the power of your Holy Spirit. It says you will be saved. But if you'd be willing to do that today, we would gladly welcome you into the kingdom of God and walk you through this glorious life of learning to die so that you might live. We're going to sing this song called Great is the Lord. Great is our God. 
let's reflect on the cross. Reflect on those things before we close and take the communion elements together after the song. You guys are welcome to sit or stand or kneel or come up or whatever it feels comfortable, all right? You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore. First Corinthians 11, Paul says this. He says, For I received from the Lord what I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. When he gave thanks, he broke it. Let's break that bread that you've got, that little piece, and let's give thanks. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the trustworthiness that was passed down from the prophets and recorded for us in the Holy Scriptures that we might have a firm foundation to stand on to guide our faith. We thank you for being willing to humble yourself to the cross, to be that example, 100% God and 100% man. And we remember you in this. And after he broke it, it said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance for me. Take that bread with joy, remembering that Jesus was crushed on your behalf so that you wouldn't have to be. That's a wonderful thing. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We look back to the cross of Calvary. We look to the presence as we take that, but we also look to what God's done in our life today and we look to the future of what he will do. So let's take that cup, remembering that it was his blood spilled out as a sacrifice, as a propitiation of sins. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no diverting of that wrath. And in that, we can sing, great are you, Lord. Amen? Let's stand together and let's sing that chorus together, celebrating the fact that Jesus is not on the cross, that Jesus has risen, that Jesus has conquered death on your behalf, on my behalf. singing like we're excited. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Shout your praise, our hearts will 
So with our breath, Lord, we come before you. We want to thank you, Jesus, that you have rescued us out of the pit of despair and that you set our feet on a rock because of what you were willing to do. And we, res we, we rejoice in the resurrection. We re rejoice in what you were willing to do on our behalf. And that is certainly something to say. Great are you, Lord. Father, we love you. We bless your name. Amen. If you have any questions or you want to learn more about our church, you can check us out simply by going online to feathersoundchurch.com.